from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. It's my distinct pleasure to introduce you our next speaker. Admiral Stavridis is a retired Navy Admiral who is currently the Dean of the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University. He has commanded at all levels of the military to include Commander European Command and as Supreme Allied Commander Europe. I could provide you with a long list of his military assignments, but you have probably already looked them up on the internet. So instead, I will share some nuggets that provide a better understanding of how his career places him at the book festival today. He is no stranger to books. He started his love of books while his family was stationed in Greece in the early 60s. Because there was no Armed Forces Network television, he spent his time at the Post Library. Now, I can totally relate to this. My family was in France at that same time, and my whole family, all seven kids, were over at the Post Library, too. What is striking to book lovers is that throughout his naval career, Admiral Stavridis published either articles or books at each successive rank to include midshipmen. I suggest he would tell you his favorite assignment was command of destroyer USS Barry. It came about a result of his daily journaling, using a typewriter of all things, during his two and a half years on board ship. The result was a compilation of a sense of wondering and mistakes, all of which were intended to convey, while his time in command was successful, not every day was fabulous, and the real point of life is not what you accomplish, but rather what you overcome. In his most recent book, Sea Power, Admiral Stavridis uses his naval experience to guide us on a journey through the seas of the world. He asks us to consider the value and the challenge the seas from both a personal and an international economic system. He helps us understand the significance of sea control and power projection. He asks that we be mindful of the geopolitics of the ocean while warning us not to overimagine the importance of our own small voyages on Earth. Please join me in welcoming a great friend of the Library of Congress, Admiral James Stavridis. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and I very much appreciate everybody coming out on this uh, drizzly day. It's kind of a mariner's day out there, I would say. Um, normally, when people hear that uh, marvelous biography introduction, thank you, Karen, uh, the first thing they say when they actually see me is, you know, I thought you'd be taller than you appear to be. Um, wh what I'd like to do today is just show you a few images, and we can go to the first slide, please. We're just going to talk about the oceans, and we're going to take about 15 minutes and kind of walk through the oceans of the world. And then we'll consider in the second 15 minutes what we ought to do about it and what are the importance of these oceans. So let me begin with a line the British Royal Navy uses, which is that the sea is one. The sea is one, meaning it connects. And most who don't spend a lot of time on the oceans and I spent 37 years in the Navy, 11 years day for day on the deep ocean in that time, don't consider that 70% of the world is water. And by the way, 70% of your body is water, and 70% of the oxygen that you breathe comes from photosynthesis in the oceans. And next slide, please. 95% of the world's trade, the lifeblood of the Earth's economy, passes across those oceans. On any given day, 50,000 ships at sea, three to five million mariners at sea. This is an extraordinary complex ecosystem, both in the ecological sense and the economic sense. And to give you one last image to hold in your head about the size of the oceans, consider this. You could take all of the land in the world and it would fit quite nicely inside 
the Pacific Ocean alone. So the seas are in many ways fundamental to the earth. Well, let's get underway. Let's start in the Pacific. This is a 1589 antiquarian chart made by Ortelis, a Dutch cartographer. And you see the discontinuities and the misunderstandings of the outline of the Pacific. But I'd invite you to go back 4,000 years before that chart was made, bottom right, the voyages of the Polynesians who traversed six, seven, eight thousand nautical miles three, four thousand years ago. These are ancient seas and none is more ancient than the Pacific. In the American mental map of the Pacific, this is what we tend to see, right? It's the Second World War when a vast American armada sails across it by 1945. In this period, we have more aircraft carriers than we have ships today. The sea is covered by the United States and we still sort of see ourselves as a preeminent Pacific maritime power. But let's look back at China's history in these seas. Here are two vessels. The little one on the left, you'll recall from your grade school studies, the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria. The little one is a model of the Santa Maria that Christopher Columbus sailed in 1492. That massive ship behind it, built in roughly the same time period, was the flagship of Chinese Admiral Zheng He. It was, as you can see, 10 times the size of these caravels of discovery that sailed from European waters. China has a deep and abiding history in the Pacific. And that relationship, the maritime reach of the United States, balanced with China's ancient sense of itself as a Pacific power, is truly the leitmotif that plays in the geopolitics of the Pacific today. And we see the Chinese Navy rising. It is reaching out, it is deploying. Here's a Chinese Corvette arriving for a port call in Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. China is also bringing its allies and coalition partners into the Pacific. This is a Chinese destroyer operating with a Russian destroyer. Now, the United States has terrific allies in the Pacific. This is also part of our relationship set. This is Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, a reliable partner, and the Japanese Navy is incredibly professional and capable. We also have excellent partners on the Korean Peninsula, South Korea. Together, we have a challenge that is, in many ways, maritime. It's from North Korea. This, of course, is Kim Jong-un, and he is well-named. He is unpredictable. He's unstable. He's not irrational. He's got a really bad haircut. <laughs> and the bad news is he is developing intercontinental ballistic missiles. This will be, at least in part, a maritime challenge that we will face with our allies and partners, Japan, South Korea, and others, and potentially a place where the U.S. and China could work together to solve a significant geopolitical challenge. So I'll, I'll close on the Pacific by just saying North Korea, upper left, the rise of China. These are Chinese ballistic missile submarines. 80% of the world's trade, bottom right, flows through that South China Sea. China's construction of artificial islands. In the Pacific today, the Western Pacific, we see significant geopolitical competition. Let's keep moving. Let's go to the Atlantic, which for centuries has been in many ways a transit zone. And nobody from the United States thinks of that North Atlantic without recalling 
World War I and World War II, the convoy operations. But again, if you step back in history, it's the Europeans, and particularly the Iberian Peninsula, who has given us Christopher Columbus, Prince Henry the Navigator. Upper left is Magellan, who circumnavigated the world. Bottom left, one less known, Bartolomeu Diaz, the first European to sail into the Indian Ocean. These mariners from the Iberian Peninsula launched enormous voyages of discovery. And in that Atlantic today, the geopolitical challenge comes from Russia. Vladimir Putin is increasing the scope and scale of the Russian maritime forces, and we'll continue to see challenges across that North Atlantic, even as we do in the Pacific. Not insurmountable, not leading to another war, but tension that will play out in this maritime sphere as we see Russian frontline ships operating as here in the Caribbean off our coast. Let's move on. The third largest ocean after the Pacific and the Atlantic is this, the Indian Ocean, which begins to hit the world stage as a spice route, bottom left. Today is increasingly a zone for everything from piracy off the coast of East Africa, hydrocarbons, and here we see the interplay of India, a rising superpower in this century, with Pakistan. That will, over the course of this century, drive geopolitics in the Indian Ocean. We see it today tactically in Yemen, in the northern reaches of the Indian Ocean, and up into the Persian Gulf, where the overlay of Shia, that's the Iranian flag, upper right, Sunni, that's the Saudi flag, bottom left, plays out in the waters around that Arabian Peninsula with our greatest ally in the region, Israel, parked in the middle of that zone. So the geopolitical challenges here will continue. And of course, we need to recall that Iran is an Indian Ocean power. On the right, you see the modern flag of Iran. The two on the upper left are the battle flags of Cyrus the Magnificent and Darius the Great. The green on the lower chart was the Persian Empire, the Iranian Empire at its greatest extent. Note all of the coastline here. Again, we will see geopolitics playing out in that Indian Ocean as well. Let's go to the Mediterranean Sea, where many of you have sailed on very benign cruises, I imagine, in the summer. My wife and I did a, a wonderful one two summers ago. But let me tell you something very somber about the Mediterranean Sea. If I could snap my fingers and bring back to life every sunken warship and every mariner who died in maritime combat in the Mediterranean Sea, you could walk across that ocean. It is an enormous zone of war. A highlight battle, if you will, if there's such a thing, was the Battle of Lepanto, the high water mark of Islamic drive in the seas off Italy against the Holy Roman Empire in the 1570s. What's the situation today? It's the Eastern Mediterranean where we see geopolitics most at play. We see great powers, the United States and Russia, on opposite sides in the conflict at Syria. We see enormous turbulence throughout the Levant, and it leads to this, a maritime challenge. Two million refugees over the last three years. This eastern Mediterranean will be a zone of challenge, if not conflict, and also because under that eastern Mediterranean is an enormous treasure trove of hydrocarbons, oil, natural gas, disputed among the nations in that region. So the Mediterranean will challenge us as well. Let's come a little closer to home. The Caribbean Sea was once the vast waterway across which the Spanish galleons moved the treasures of the Americas. Today, bottom left, the Panama Canal is the beating heart 
of the U.S. economy as trade goods flow back and forth. And it's challenged. It's not geopolitical challenge, nation on nation, but it's narcotics, it's gangs, it's natural disasters, it's refugees here as well. All of it leads to significant maritime activity by our Coast Guard working together with the Navy, law enforcement, of course, taking the lead. Let's go to the top of the world, the Arctic. This is USS Jeanette. It was the ship sent to the Arctic in the 1870s when many cartographers, geographers, still had a theory that the top of the world had a hidden temperate zone in it. This is just over 100 years ago. The Jeanette tried to get through the ice, was frozen in place. Many of its crew died. Today, the Arctic is a little less icy. Here's a news flash. Global warming is real. The ice is melting. And it's going to open that northern trade routes, increase geopolitical competition, uncover hydrocarbons. On one side is Russia. On the other side are five NATO nations. The Arctic has never seen war. It will be our challenge to ensure that we can continue to say that as the century unfolds. If we are able to say it, it will be the result of the work of organizations like this, the Arctic Council, which brings together Russia and NATO, one of the few places we have a coherent conversation at the moment. The United States needs to up its game. I'm showing you a picture of the one operational icebreaker the U.S. has. Denmark, a nation of five million, operates six icebreakers. We need to improve ourselves in this zone. So those are the oceans. And now, if I could, for one moment, I'll just address the challenges broadly on all the oceans, because the sea is one. Fishing, illegal fishing. One fish in five caught on the ocean of the world is caught illegally. Fish stocks declining probably 50% over the last 40 years. This is a multi, multi-billion dollar business, and it is exacerbated by piracy and illegality. Additionally, again, global warming is going to change the oceans and attack the ability to conduct the photosynthesis for the oxygen we breathe. With apologies to former Vice President Al Gore, who has often said the lungs of the earth are the Amazon, they contribute. The lungs of the earth are the oceans. So that's a quick, a very quick voyage around the world. And so right about now, you ought to be saying, <laughs> OK, Admiral, you know, a lot of challenges out there. What do you think? What should we do about it? What can we do about it? What are the opportunities to engage in this maritime world? And this is really what the book Sea Power is about. What are the strategic ideas for the 21st century for our nation and for the world in engaging? Well, let me bring you a quick shot from Game of Thrones. If you really want a maritime strategist, it's Euron Greyjoy who said, build me a thousand ships and I will give you this world. We do need to be capable mariners. But how do we do that? I'm going to start with this. We had to listen better. We had to listen more to the oceans themselves, to their health. We had to listen to our allies and partners. We had to listen to our opponents. This, by the way, is not Photoshop. This is a Belgian air defense system uh, from about 80 years ago. It's not still in operation. He's listening for incoming aircraft. It's quite innovative, but I put it here for us as metaphor. We need to listen more. We need to do exactly what you're doing here at this marvelous book festival. Come, listen to ideas, challenge ideas. This is the Naval War College in Newport, Rhode Island, a center where we take a break from the day-to-day, -day, not only listening, but studying, reading, writing, 
publishing. What else can we do for the oceans? We can hold on to our values. We can hold on to our values. They come to us from the ancient Greeks, Socrates, from the ancient Eastern Asians, that's the Buddha, through our founding fathers, upper left, the Enlightenment, Voltaire, to principled leaders like Angela Merkel. We need to work together with democracy, liberty, freedom of speech. Those values will help us in the oceans. We need to work with partners. The United States should not become the world's maritime policemen. We should be in maritime coalitions. These are French special forces capturing Somali pirates. They have flown from a Danish warship. They refueled from an Italian frigate. They operate under the surveillance of a Portuguese maritime patrol aircraft, US intelligence from satellites, these kind of multinational coalitions to create security and environmental improvement are vital, alliances and coalitions. Our allies can help us in things like freedom of navigation challenges. We need to do more of this as well from the sea. As I look at the tragedy unfolding in Houston, I'm so proud of the US Navy sending two massive ships, a big deck amphibious carrier, a large landing ship dock. Right behind him, potentially, we could send a hospital ship. When I was commander of Southern Command, before being the NATO commander, I deployed these hospital ships routinely throughout the Caribbean, Latin America. My counterpart in the Pacific does the same. This kind of humanitarian work from the sea is part of our ability to leverage the strategy of the ocean. We need new partners. I would focus in this century on India, which will be a rising maritime power. We have exercises every year with India, Japan, and the United States. And we need to work jointly within our own military, our Marines, our Coast Guard, our Navy working together within the context that I've laid out here of international, interagency, private, public, all of that allows us to interact, for example, with the International Maritime Organization to work with private sector maritime entities. Blue Water Metrics, a small company that uses commercial shipping to measure the ocean's health. It's a powerful private-public connective idea. We need conversations at all levels about the oceans, and we need to read more about the sea. And that's why I'm so happy to see so many people turn out to a talk about the oceans. And it can be fiction. If you've never read Nicholas Montserrat's The Cruel Sea, get up now, leave, and go read it. It's such a fabulous book. We should understand the maritime thinkers like Chester Nimitz. We should understand the battles, the hinges of history, like Jutland, the rules of the game and understand that as we look back through the history of the world, so often big, big doors swing on small hinges, and so often those small hinges are maritime battles. Salamis saves Greece from Persia. Actium divides the Roman Empire. Trafalgar saves the Brits. Lepanto stops Islam. Jutland preserves the British fleet in World War I. Midway is the resurgence for America. These maritime battles matter, and we need to understand their impact on the oceans. I'll wrap up now, and I'd love to take a couple of questions or comments. I've talked a lot about the oceans, and you'll also find in this book a very personal story of my time at sea, many, many years at sea. And the seas can be terrible and challenging, and things go wrong. And over the last 60 days, we've seen two US Navy destroyers in terrible collisions, 17 sailors dead. 
To put that in perspective for you, tragically, we've lost in Afghanistan this year 11 soldiers. In the last couple months, we've lost 17 of our finest sailors at sea. The oceans will challenge us, and that's part of sea power as well. But I will say this, I loved being a sailor. I loved my time on the ocean. It's the ultimate office with a view. I hope you take some time to dip into sea power and learn more about the history, the geopolitics, and what it's like to sail these oceans. Thank you very, very much. Thank you for coming out. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. We'll just, I think, kind of go back and forth. So we'll start over here. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, my name is Commander Ben Sipley. I'm actually a Navy Federal Executive Fellow this year. Uh, so appreciate uh, getting the chance to hear you speak today, sir. But I'm actually working on a project on how illegal, unregulated, unreported fishing leads to regional uh, destabilization and eventually potentially conflict and radicalization. So you talked a little bit about fishing in regards to ocean health. I wonder if you'd comment a little bit, sir, I on can. how you see. I can. Um, I, I have a piece coming out, an op-ed called The Coming War for Fish. And it, it sounds absurd, doesn't it, that, that we'd kind of get in a war about fish. But as Ben knows, the conflict is growing. I'd point particularly to the South China Sea, uh, where China has a massive fishing fleet that is encroaching. Uh, we can look in the North Atlantic. We see partners that are traditionally very close come to uh, violent ends over fishing violations. We see Indonesia blowing up illegal fishing craft. Um, more and more, we are going to see wars over fish, just as in the past we've seen wars over land, water, oil. This is a war over protein, and it is increasingly the principal source of protein around the world. So think of it in the context of oil or water or another resource. It will, to, to counter it, we need international, interagency, private, public, the things I've talked about, but we are going to need robust cooperation between not just the navies of the world, Ben, but the coast guards of the world as well. It's a big topic, thanks for raising it. Yes, sir. Um, Jim Bailing. Um, I served a couple years in the active Navy. Terrific. But, um, what I'm wondering about has to do with these accidents, so-called. Sure. About um, the people getting killed, the ships getting hit in the side. I mean, it doesn't seem to me that the people who are commanding these ships don't know what they're doing. I don't believe that. Yeah. So can you give us some I idea can. of why these things are happening? I can. Um, First of all, Jim, I had the same reaction you did, that it just seems beyond a possible coincidence that two Navy destroyers would be hit uh, and have that kind of tragic loss of life over such a short period of time. Um, the Navy is conducting incredibly thorough investigations, and they will look at um, any possibility for a site. I'll give you five things, and I'm going to do them fast bad leadership on the individual ship. The captain might be a terrific mariner, but he or she might be someone that his officer of the deck is afraid to call, got a temper, bad environment on the bridge, possibility. Number two, equipment. Are those radars accurately working, the early warning systems that are built into them? Number three, training. Are we pushing our people too fast to hit career wickets and not giving them enough time in the basics of seamanship and navigation? Number four, op tempo, operational tempo. Were those particular ships driven too hard? Were people not getting rest? You would never want an airline captain driving you who had not received his or her mandatory eight-hour rest. Unfortunately, I can assure you that those bridge watch standers are not getting that eight hours of rest. So op tempo. And fifth and finally, Jim, I would say number of ships in the U.S. Navy. We need 350. Every responsible analyst agrees on that. We have 270. Those ships are being pushed hard. It won't be any one of those, but my bet is it'll be a combination of them. Thank you. Yes, sir. 
Good afternoon. My name is Daniel Gagliano, and I read in your chapter on the Indian Ocean about how you see the Middle East as a currently embroiled Cold War. So why do you consider it cold, and what would it take to turn that? <laughs> yeah, I, I, great question, Daniel. I think as I was writing the book about a year ago, it seemed a little cooler than it does now. Um, the Cold War analogy in the book, Daniel, comes from the Shia-Sunni tension, which is religious, of course, in character, underlaid by a geopolitical tension between Persian and Arab. Those of you, most of you, are Christian. So we've seen this movie before in the Christian faith. It was called The Wars of the Reformation, the 1500s, Catholics and Protestants with an overlay of geopolitics, Spanish Empire, British, Netherlands become ground zero, one third of Europe's population is killed. It lasted 100 to 150 years. No historical analogy is perfect, but that one kind of rings the bell, and the war is getting hotter, not cooler. Thanks. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Jack. I recently uh, was recommended a book uh, by a former sub commander in the U.S. Navy. It's called Blind Man's Bluff. Oh, yeah, sure. Is, uh, I found it a great read. Yes. Uh, the question is, is there a chapter still to be written under your scenario for the American submarine forces and as a part of our triangular strategy of national defense? Um, the subsurface world will continue to be absolutely crucial. Um, and the tension there is whether or not at some point there'll be a technology that effectively renders the oceans uh, transparent to overhead sensors. Thus far, submarines are able to continue to be very well hidden. As long as that is the case, um, I think they will be, in the end, the preeminent uh, platform of war. And that you know, hurts me to say that as a destroyer officer. Um, and if I were an aviator, it would really hurt me to say it about the carriers. But submarines, because of their cloak of invisibility, until that is pierced, they will be at the center of our strategy. That's why it's important that we uh, build them, invest in those technologies. And secondly, and final point, our allies operate submarines effectively as well as we do on diesels in close. So when you can marry, which we don't do, so when you can marry up the allied diesel capability to the U.S. nuclear capability, that's a very potent ability to control the seas and project power. Yes, sir. My name is Zach. Uh, my father is in the Army, but I still appreciate hearing you speak. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, in a lot of what we've been reading and hearing, North Korea is said to be a Air Force and more of a land-based conflict, but you described it as a maritime one. Mm. I was wondering if you could expand on that. I can. Um, it's particularly maritime from the defensive perspective of the United States and our allies. Um, as you may have just seen over the, the weekend, North Korea launched a missile over Japan. The ability to knock down those long-range missiles, which is really what we're worried about with North Korea in, in the macro sense, much of it will be based on destroyers operating at sea with the Aegis system. Secondly, if, and I don't advocate this, I don't think it's a, I don't think there's a good military option against North Korea, but if we're forced to take one, the ability to control those ocean approaches to North Korea and to cut off their ability to come out after our aircraft carriers will be crucial because our land-based air on the Korean Peninsula will be highly at risk. Those aircraft carriers, which can move 1,000 miles a day, operate 75 attack aircraft, um, are nuclear powered, don't need to be refueled. That kind of capability and its mobility around that peninsula will be crucial. I don't mean to say that the efforts of the Army and the Air Force are not going to be critical as well. Again, big doors swinging on small hinges. I think the maritime piece of this, both defensively and offensively from the carriers, will be crucial. Thanks, Zach. Yes, sir. Master, hey, Master, Master Chief. Chief. Yes. Dave Mattingly, and I'm a contributor 
uh, to strategy the bridge and divergent options. And I've written quite a bit on the South China Sea, especially as it applies with the UN uh, Convention on the Law of the Sea. Sure. Which, if you could touch upon the U.S.'s. I can. Um, so get everyone on the same sheet. The South China Sea, big body of water, think Gulf of Mexico. China claims it as a territorial sea. They say that we own the entire body of water. They show us a dashed line. We own everything inside it. We own all the hydrocarbons. They're territorial seas, so we will control the shipping, and we will simply annex it. It would be as though the United States simply declared the Gulf of Mexico were a U.S. territorial sea. It is a preposterous claim. It has gone to the international court. It's been soundly rejected. China continues to front this claim, and they support it by building artificial islands and saying, that's Chinese territory, that's Chinese territory, that's Chinese territory. They are playing a long game, Master Chief, and their hope is that over time we'll simply become tired of the challenge. If I were a Chinese strategist, I'd do exactly the same thing. Why? Because what China does not have are hydrocarbons. China needs those. It's part of their long-range plan. So I don't think we're going to go to war about this. I think we are going to challenge them on the high seas. We're going to fly our airplanes over their artificial islands. We're going to steam our ships through their territorial sea. And we're going to continue to make the case under international law and the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea that we are observing and enforcing customary international law as described by the international courts. I think if we stay in the game and stay serious, we will avoid a real confrontation. If we back down, we will regret that in the long throw of our nation's history. Yes, sir. Good afternoon, sir. My name is Michael Minerva. Mike? It seems like, even amongst naval officers, the awareness or uh, general understanding of sea power and naval power comes and goes whenever a major book is written by, like, Grotius or Mahan or yourself, <laughs> or, um, yeah. or something tragic happens yes. recently. What can we do to maintain a common awareness consistently about sea power and its importance? That way we're constantly developing it and the sh numbers of our ships aren't yeah. roller coastering. Yeah. A great question from someone named Minerva, uh, which, of course, picks up on Athena, uh, the goddess of wisdom. And I, I do want to stipulate that Grotius, the world's preeminent international lawyer, probably up here in history. Mahan up here, the great strategist Stavridis, about down here. <laughs> um, but I'll, I'll take your point of how do we maintain a level of knowledge and understanding. And the answer is the old-fashioned way, which is education. It means in our ROTC programs, at the Naval Academy, even at Officer Candidate School, where we take graduates of universities, um, we need to ensure that we're not only covering administration and inspections and all the important things we want a young officer to know, but also our history and why strategy matters. That plug into the educational process for a naval officer needs to occur really at every step. And, and certainly when you go through war college in your late 30s, and even in executive education programs like we run up at Tufts, the Fletcher School, or over at the Kennedy School, there's no simple, easy way to do this other than education. Yes, sir. PhD from the Fletcher School Law, two masters. So, I mean, I got everything that was there. Excellent. Uh, my grandfather in the Great War was in the U.S. Navy as well. Thank you. And used to say, if you want to fight, join the Army. <laughs> uh, my question to you, and this is open source, are two points of really Chinese provocative uh, issues. First of all, they have built, um, again, open source, these kind of ports that we see in Japan for the U.S. fleet, and they do mock attacks on them, which is kind of right. shades of, you know, the Japanese and attack on Pearl Harbor. And secondly, they seem to be building ports all over the world, especially, for example, in Pakistan. Karachi's port is like at 50% capacity, right. and yet they're building one right next door. And of course, the Indians 
are thinking from, you know, the Indian Navy is this is going to be a direct assault sure. on them. What, how do you deal with these kinds of yeah. issues? Um, and let me add one to your litany, which is a very good one. Uh, China is also building a massive overseas military base in Djibouti. Um, and that second chart I showed you with choke points, you will find very much this program. In fact, they are using Mahan's playbook right in front of us. So the answer is when you want to deal with the network, you have to have a strong network. So we need to leverage our strongest comparative advantage, which is our allies, partners, and friends. This is why India, particularly this alignment of the United States, India, and Japan is so very powerful. So the short answer is they're going to build a network. We need to maintain and strengthen our network. And I would argue back to values, our democratic alignment with NATO, with Japan, with Australia gives us a much bigger pool of partners than China will enjoy. I think we have time for one more here and one more there. Sir. Thank you very much. Uh, sir, I'm Mick McEwen, a retired Air Force officer. And uh, I first wanted to thank you for your amazing contributions, your service to this country. Thank you. And your comments on Morning Joe. <laughs> <laughs> sure. but my real question was uh, you served, and that had to do with your perception of strategy vis a vis the Chinese in the South Chinese Sea. Two observations, if I may, sir. Uh, as an Air Force guy, the picture just before your Naval War College photograph. That yeah, fact, interesting. just before the uh, Naval War College photograph, that was in fact the uh, National War College in the background? It, you know, it looks like it. It's actually not. Oh, I, really? I've done a serious research on this. Go ahead and ask a question, yeah, though, sir. I, I <laughs> really, it's a statement, that is that the word around town, sir, is that you married about three levels above your authorized pay grade. Don't we all? <laughs> and, I, and I mention that because your wonderful <laughs> wife, Laura, taught our children in preschool at St. Aidan's, and we want to equally Thank Lord for that. Oh, that's Thank so you, kind, Mick. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Young lady, you have the last question. Good afternoon. I heard that you said that NATO countries and Russia need to work together to combat global warming. Is NATO hurting us in this respect? Um, I think that's a terrific question, by the way. I think that NATO is helping because it creates an alignment of nations who share fundamental values, as we've talked about. Secondly, NATO helps us because the NATO nations together have 52% of the world's GDP. So they have enormous economic capability to address these kinds of challenges. Thirdly, NATO provides a forum. It's a place where these nations can gather and discuss crucial issues to include the security challenges that come from environmental degradation. So I would argue NATO is a force for good. A multiplier effect would be if we could convince our Russian counterparts, if you will, to join at least in that conversation. We may continue to disagree with Russia on Syria and Ukraine and cyber, but can we not agree on the challenges to the environment and to the ocean. I think there's at least a chance of that. And in that sense, I think NATO is a force for good. Let me close by saying uh, thank you all for coming out today, uh, for thinking about the oceans, uh, and for supporting this incredible festival, the National Book Festival. It's an honor to be here. Thank you very much. A pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.